Okay, uh, so we were discussing Miller compensated opera yesterday, and uh, essentially this was. So if we, we saw that if we put this capacitance C across GM2, we saw that if we put this capacitance C across GM2, uh, some, some very interesting things happen. And then we saw that uh, the poles associated with these nodes V1 and V0 split in the sense that uh, the poles associated with V1, that is, if we call it V1, they go from, let's say, let me call without and with Miller. So without Miller, with Miller. So the pole P1 associated with that node V1 without Miller compensation was minus, let me drop the minus because we know it's left half plane, uh, GBS1 by C1. With Miller, it, it became the numerator conductance remained the same. In the denominator, it becomes C1 plus an extra capacitance. And the extra capacitance was essentially the capacitance looking into this terminal. If you think that GM2 acts at lower frequencies, acts as a volt at the uh, the relationship between V1 and V0 is GM2 over GDS2 at lower frequencies, right? In fact, the DC gain of GM2 is GM2 over GDS2. Instead of saying GM2 over GDS2 repeatedly, I'll just say AV2 or A2. Uh, let's say um, this gain is AV2 between the input and the output of the it's negative, right? Because we have inversion. Yeah, the gain is AV2 between the you know, between V1 and V0 at lower frequencies. Then over a certain range of frequencies, we can approximate the looking in impedance into, into V1 to be capacitive, but in that case, capacitance is amped up. It's amplified by the value of the gain of GM2. So this becomes C1 plus one plus AV2 times C. And it's customary to call this CC because it's a compensation capacitor. So that's what uh, we'll also follow. Without Miller, P2 was at GDS2 over C2. But with Miller, something very interesting happened. And that was your P2 shifted to a higher frequency. And the expression of P2 obviously in the denominator had this capacitance C1 that we expect, so rather C2, but we had something more. And whatever more it was, it was essentially the series capacitance between CC and C1. So CC. And on the numerator, we the time constant associated with this node V0 was, or rather the conductor associated with node, uh, with that node V0 was GDS2, which will definitely come, but we had something more dominant than GDS2. And that was because if we apply, if we only, only uh, concentrate on this structure, Right. If we only concentrate on this structure and we apply an out, uh, we try to figure out the effective conductance looking into this node. Then we saw that if we apply a test voltage at V0, then a part of the test voltage or the fraction of test voltage will get formed, it will appear at the input of GM2. And that fraction is nothing but the capacitive divided version of that. So that becomes CC by CC plus C1 times GM2, 
will be the current that you will draw. And that current that you will be drawing, will, you will be drawing from the test voltage source that you have, would have applied at V0. So this times GM2 become the conductance. And you had some other, some non dominant terms, which we will ignore. So as it turns out, what we discussed yesterday, also that uh, this is this is the dominant term in the numerator. And also, if you choose, if we choose CC to be much greater than C1, then this becomes, then P2 becomes approximately, obviously, we have to be careful with this. P2 becomes GM2 over C2 plus C1. So this is interesting because not only uh, it, it simplifies that humongous expression that we got, it also gives you some intuition as to how to play around with the locations of the poles and zeros in order to stabilize your system. Okay. Now, uh, the, the key takeaway from this brief discussion is the fact that not only your pole P1 has moved to a lower frequency after application of this para, uh, uh, of this compensation capacitor CC. The pole P2 has also moved to a higher frequency because if you compare these two terms, P2 is proportional to GDS2 in uh, uh, without Miller case, and after you apply Miller compensation, P2 became uh, proportional to GM2 over uh, P2 became proportional to GM2. So if C2 and C1 are of the same order, then you can see that P2 has moved to the, to the right. So that is good. That's good for us. That, that helps in pole splitting. However, there is something uh, that we haven't yet discussed. If I go back to our Miller compensation expression. So this was, so whatever we have been doing is, uh, is factorized in the denominator. Right. We are trying to find the roots of the denominator, or in other words, the poles of the loop chain. But if you turn your attention to the numerator, you see that it's, it's, it has a S term, right? It has a zero in the numerator. And that zero, uh, not only it has a zero, it has a zero on the which, which half plane, right half or left half? Right half plane zero, right? So right half plane zero has, yeah, uh, its impact on the phase is similar to having a pole on the which half plane, left half plane, right? So you have an additional phase lag. By the way, where is this zero location? GM2 by C, great. So in the, we didn't have this zero, zero in the without Miller compensation case, but in this case, let me now reintroduce this negative signs just to ensure that the Z, since the zero is on the right half plane, better to demarcate that. So GM2 over C. Okay. So now what does the Bode plot of this look like? Assuming that we have been designing for uh, a well-behaved stable system. So now uh, I, can sim I can simplify this Miller compensation um, H of L of S as sum A naught one plus one minus S by Z one plus S by Z one. Okay, or if I have to be more accurate, you can do this. You can write the other form also, but you can you have to ensure that you are careful with the uh, signs. So in this case, uh, E1 is at, where was E1? E1 is at GDS1 by C1 plus 1 plus AV2 CC. And can you comment on, if, if we assume this, if we assume this CC to be much greater than C1. Correct, both are left up. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, system is outright unstable, right? So, can you comment on? Uh, can I further simplify the P one 
uh, expression? Is, is there some dominant case that you see? Now, this is P1. Can I further simplify it? And one plus AV2 is AV2 essentially, right? right? So basically this becomes P1 becomes GDS1 by AV2, you see? P2 is GM2 by C2 plus C1. And what about the zero? Is the zero before P2, after P2? Can a comment be made? Magnitude of the zero, obviously. It depends, right? You cannot write, in a, write away and make the comment because it depends on the value of C. Or rather, in this case, CC, right? So, depending upon how you, what is the, uh, what is the relationship between CC and C2, it can be either side of it, right? So, let's take at higher than P2. I mean, you can as well take at lower than P2. It doesn't really matter. Let's say, so zero is here. So, if that is the case, by the way, what is A0? What will be the expression for A0? How will you look at? Yeah, so A0 shouldn't con contain any capacitances because low frequency DC gain. So, you open all the capacitances and see whatever you get. And obviously, uh, whatever we get is the open loop without capacitance expression that hasn't changed. So this becomes GM1 by GDS1 times GM2 over GDS2. So this doesn't change. So this becomes like this. Then you probably go here, then here, then here. Okay, by the way. Uh, then here. So again, I uh, by, by the way I have sketched the plot, I have assumed that the UGP falls between P1 and P2. But it not it need not necessarily be the case. It's uh, it's upon the designer to choose the values such that UGP falls there. So Assuming certain whatever constraints we have, and assuming that UGB falls there, what do you think? We, I mean, how how should we go about approaching the phase margin? So we need the expressions for each of these lines, piecewise line segments, to start. So these piecewise line segments, we need the expressions for each of them, and then assume that if the UGB falls there what will be the expression and then see whether assumptions are correct or not. So this is A0, clearly UGB cannot fall there. So I need the expression for this line. So what will be that expression for this line in terms of P1, P2, A0Z? This line will be A0 by one minus S by E1, right? Because P2 is at a higher frequency, it should not bother. Z is at a higher frequency, it should not bother. So this is, again, it, if S is more than P1 because we are at higher frequency, so this becomes this. So, so I think I have, I should be consistent with this uh, signs, right? This negative and positive are messing up. So let me just say that I'll ask, all the poles I'll use it as plus because otherwise I'll have to use P1 negative in the Bode plot and all. So this is the expression and this becomes, when you set this to one, whatever omega you get is your UGB. So UGB is A0 times P1. So this becomes A0 is GM1, GM2 by GDS1, GDS2. P1 is GDS1 by the Miller capacitance, that is 
gm2 over gts2 that is the av2 times cc right so this term this term cancels gds2 G, gds1 gds1 cancels so you get gm1 by cc so the ugb frequency omega ugb is gm1 by cc okay so now how do you ensure that this uh, omega ugb falls before p2 you have to choose your values of gm1 gm2 cc such a way that your uh, ugb falls there for any random values of gm1 cc and gm2 it will not so that's where the design comes in okay so we i mean as we know that in order to ensure that your closed loop system will have proper step response by proper i mean it will not ring like crazy you have to ensure that at the ugb point you have minus 20 db per decade roll off or in other words the system behaves like a first order system around ugb if that is the case you have to ensure that omega ugb falls before p2 and if your omega ugb is gm1 by cc and your p2 is gm2 by c2 plus c1 right so then as a designer you have to choose cc and gm2 and gm1 these combinations in such a way that omega ugb falls before p2 right so so that is a, that becomes a designer's choice now at times you cannot choose all of these uh, gm1 cc c2 and everything uh, just to ensure that the system is stable they they you have sometimes you need this gm1 gm2 to set the dc gain right you cannot just i mean you cannot compromise dc gain just because you want something stable so you have, once you set the dc gain that is let's assume your gm1 gm2 and uh, all those things are set then what you can do you can set your you can choose the cc accordingly you can choose cc in such a way that your uh, ugb falls between p1 and p2 okay and and uh, but there is an additional issue if you if you I mean, one might say that hey i can simply choose cc to be really large right i can choose cc to be really large then i can pull this p2 uh, pull this ugb to a lower frequency uh, because looks like and the omega ugb is is a strong function of cc it's basically gm1 by cc if i cannot change gm1 i can move the omega ugb by simply changing cc one can do that but there is an issue yeah, that the issue is of this right hand side zero that is also a function of cc so that will also start moving in so what will be the phase margin what will be the phase of this loop at omega ugb so because of p1 what will be the contribution what will be the phase because of p1 at ugb approximately p1 is at much lower frequency than omega ugb minus tan inverse of omega ugb by p1 and if that ratio is very large then minus 90 degree minus pi by 2 and then because of p2 you will have minus tan inverse omega ugb by p2 and then you will have additional z so now whether it will be plus or minus plus tan inverse omega ugb by by z okay but now this this zero is in right half plane right isn't it so what modifications do you need to do true but i mean is the my, my question is is this expression even correct whether it will have plus or it will be minus it's 
right right pi minus or in other words i can simply say minus right so ultimately i mean if you look at this expression right so if p1 and p2 are positives and z, z is also positive in this case whatever happens to the phase because of the poles will also happen because of the zero because zero is on the right half plane right so you get I mean, that's why I mean, I was talking about this PID controller stuff. So, uh, just before the class, so this inti I mean, if you assume, if you neglect these one plus terms, right? So, this becomes like a proportionality, this becomes an integrator kind of scenario, right? So, so your these one plus S plus P1, one plus S plus P2 gives you phase lag. And if you have a right hand side zero, that also gives you phase lag. But if you have a left hand left hand side zero, that gives you a phase lead. You have done lead lag controllers. So the purpose of this lead lag controller is to cancel the excess phase of a pole with a zero, right? So that to make the system stable. But in this case, for that to happen, the zero also needs to give the same phase contribution in the opposite direction that of the pole, right? Then only you can cancel the excess phase. But if you can, if you, if you don't do that, if zero is also giving the same phase lag as a pole, then you are having a double whammy, right? So you you you, you essentially in the Nyquist plot you get an additional phase lag because of the zero, and you go closer and closer to the minus one zero term. So that translates in terms of excess phase lag as as this. Okay, so you have at omega U G P, you don't you not only have the phase lag due to the extra pole, you have a phase lag due to the extra zero. So that's a problem. That's one of the problems of a Miller compensated automaton. Okay. Yes. I we don't know where it will be. Depending on the value of CC, it can also go left of P2. Right. So so that that's what I said. It's a designer's choice. If you just plug in a value of CC, it might not necessarily be the uh, best case solution. Okay. Okay. Fine. Uh, so this is something that you'll have to uh, be aware of. Now, uh, so that's pretty much it as far as I wanted to discuss Miller compensation and Rockham. There are a lot more things to discuss, but we don't have bandwidth of this course. And and uh, if you are interested, you can take six one three uh, or six ten, where we might discuss uh, six one three. Definitely, we discuss this in a lot more detail. Uh, so now, if we if we uh, if we uh, replace those block diagrams like GM1, GM2 with transistors, what do I get? Your GM1 was we assume to be a diff differential amplifier. No, I can write it in cheat sheet and come up with. So it will be given. Yeah, it will be given. Yeah, yeah, it will be similar. But if you remember how to how we came up with it, I mean, it will automatically come to you, right? So each transistor has its place in the diagram. I mean, we haven't used anything that is not necessary. So this was this was giving my GM one. This is giving GM two. And now we needed a compensation capacitor between the output of GM1 to the final output. And if you have to close the loop, you had to connect, let's say I call it VA and VB. I had to connect VA to V0. So this is the unit again way of, uh, uh, of feeding, I mean, of closing the loop. Now, let me not show the closing loop part because that is a subtext. We all understand that will not be using an op-amp uh, in open loop. 
So this I naught, I mean, we know enough how to get this I naught from a master current source. You say I have a master current source. So we use negative feedback to generate the magic required voltage. And we get this. This is I naught. So this current, maybe it's also I naught. It's one is to one mirroring ratio. Uh, we can replace this current source also with a transistor. We call this M zero. And maybe, I mean, because now this, who sets GM1 by the way? Which current source, which current sets G, GM1? I not, right? And which current will set GM2? The current that will flow in this step, right? So, so now, because you have to set GM1 and GM2 independently based on requirements of poles and zeros also. So you, you, it did not necessarily be that I2 has to be equal to I not. Okay. It need not necessarily be that I2 has to be equal to I on. It can be something else, right? So let me call this mirroring ratio of one is to N with respect to M naught. So the, and we, so this, this had the trans, transconductance of GM1. Right, so this is uh, a fairly good two-stage op-amp, uh, very popular, widely used in literature, different versions of it. Here I showed you with an input uh, input pair of NMOS, you can as well have the input pair of PMOS. The other thing that I didn't talk about is the output of the first stage, right? So this, So this is nothing but so the output of the first stage I had paid to a PMOS, a PMOS common source amplifier, right? But it did not necessarily be the case. I can feed the output of the first stage to an NMOS common source amplifier also, right? I could have as well done that, done this. This was similar to that major quiz or mid-sem question, major quiz question, I think. I could have as well done this. So what do you think would have, I mean, I will not solve this for you uh, right now, but what do you think, if, if, is there a plus or minus, or is there a positive or a negative thing, whether, how should I choose, whether should I feed the output of the first stage to an NMOS or a PMOS, common source amplifier? What might change or what might not change? Yeah, so how do I decide whether I this M5 should be this M5 should be a PMOS or an NMOS? I mean, this could as well have been an M5. Uh, okay, that's true. To, um, that's true in the sense of I mean, uh, what do you mean by output as acts as a better voltage buffer, right? Um, but both of them, I mean, if you bias them with same currents, both of them will have similar outs, right? So it has nothing to do with DC gain. You can get a DC gain on output resistance. You can get a pretty good in either cases. Pardon? 
Ah, okay. Which one of them will have better swing and what will determine that? No, swing has, by swing do you mean swing limits or swing, you mean gain? Ah, swing limits, right? So essentially what will, I mean, uh, you can do it yourself. We will see that uh, if, if V not, I mean, if this goes to, if this, if this goes to an NMOS, right? If this, go, this goes to an NMOS, then this voltage in order to bias the NMOS with decent currents and uh, uh, this voltage has to be close to threshold voltage, right? Maybe 100 millivolt or 200 millivolt above threshold voltage. So the expected value of this voltage has to be closer to ground, not closer to VED. I mean, if I divide the whole supply, possible supply between zero to VDD, the expected voltage is closer to VDD, closer to ground, right? So essentially here you are one VSG below VDD. Had that been an NMOS, you would have been one VGS above ground, right? Does that make sense? So if that had been the case, what would have been the state of M2? It would have been well biased or would it have been a problem? Yeah, right. So since since um, if you are closer to VDD, M2 is, if, if, if this voltage is closer to VDD, M2 is safely biased in saturation. But if this voltage gets closer to ground, M2 can get into trouble, right? So that's why the decision of whether you choose uh, the second stage to be NMOS and the PMOS between them. In most cases, people choose PMOS. But having said that, this closer to VDD, closer to ground approximations tend to break down at lower supply voltages, right? If you have, let's say, one volt supply and your threshold voltage itself is 400 millivolt, then it doesn't matter, right? If you are but if you distant from both sides, you can choose as I mean um, whatever you want. So uh, so in so that's why when you in slightly older technologies where you can use five volt supplies or ten volt supplies even in that case you choose accordingly. But when you have one volt supply, you can choose whatever. Right? Not too much of a problem. Okay, so the the reason and the intuition behind this is if you if this were a n mos right so if this were an n mos let me sketch it here so if the second stage were an n mos and you had to bias it with this current then this should have paid here right so this in order to bias this this should have been one vgs above ground so one VGS above ground, maybe uh, what I mean, uh, 500 millivolts, 600 millivolts. So this voltage should have been 600 millivolt. If that is 600 millivolt is closer to ground, then M2 can get into trouble because you have to keep some quiescent on VB, correct? But if you are like 600 millivolt above VDD, uh, below VDD, that is, if you use a PMOS, let's say VDD is five volt, 600 millivolt below VDD. 4.4 volt. Not good. Yes, right? Yes. Where? Right. Yeah, so this will be common source amplifier, right? Second stage is a common source stage. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, that that this will not exist then, right? I mean, if I use a second stage to be N, N MOS, then this stage doesn't exist, isn't it? So in that case, you will be feeding something from here. Uh, so basically, you assume that this this stage doesn't exist, and your output stage becomes this. And this goes here, this becomes the output we want. Right? Who may see? Let me remove this. But anyhow, I mean, uh, this is something you can figure it out from. So, one of the reasons of those questions that you saw in major quiz, even in yesterday's quiz, was 
basically for you to appreciate who sets this voltage. Okay, it's not the GM1 that sets the voltage, it's the GM2 that sets the required voltage and provided it's a negative feedback and, and so on. Okay, fine. Yes. Okay, okay. Okay, fine. Yeah, we can spend a couple of minutes on that. So, you are, uh, are you comfortable with this? Not? Oh, oh sure. So, let's do that once again. So, This is good. Okay. How do I get GM2? Yeah, so or a common source amplifier. Yeah. Uh, right? Right? What is V naught? Okay. okay. Any any other questions? Okay. Great. So, uh, um, ideally, I would have liked to end the course here, but. Uh, next semester, you'll be taking 380, 380 lab, right? So there, uh, uh, you don't use MOSFETs, you use BJTs. So I like to just take whatever, one and a half lectures on how a BJT behaves. Basically, it's, again, identical to a MOSFET with some differences. Okay. So... Whatever we talk, we talk about is in the syllabus. <laughs> See, it's not, it, it will, I mean, what I'll do, I'll try to ensure that this is not a different beast, right? So ultimately in the small signal, everything is same, right? So that's what the motivation is, right? Otherwise I'll not start a completely new stuff now, right? But I, I presume you've already done, you've been introduced to BJTs in ac 201 right? Yeah, that's why this is a refresher. <laughs> so you'll see, I mean, if you have forgotten, it's good, right? Just start off with a clean slate. <laughs> so, uh, so just like we did for a PMOS, we'll, we'll, we'll see that this is not something that is uh, completely different. So let's draw an analogy between, yes. Yeah, I'll put the lectures tonight itself. You can look at it. So, in case of uh, uh, in case of a MOSFET, you're just like you say that I have the input controlling terminal is gate and source, and the output terminals are between drain and source. You have this structure of BJT where the terminologies are base. That is B. This is emitter. That is E. And this is collector. And in case of a BJT, uh, the construction is of two, uh, two diodes put back to back. Right? So we'll not get into the construction of the diode. But the reason I mentioned these two diodes back to back is because uh, the, the current equations is similar to that of a diode. Okay, so in case of an, just like in case of a uh, NMOS, your current ID was in case of a BJT, this current IC 
is some constant i s times exponential v b e over v t minus one times okay if I neglect channel and modulation equivalent this is what it is and v t where yeah so the nomenclature is all messed up I let me come to that right so so v t is uh, kt over q which is 26 millivolt at 300 kelvin right so this is the uh, this is how we remember it and just like in case of a, in, in case of an n mos if you sketch the id vds characteristics you get something like this So similarly, in case of a BJT, you also get, so this is IC and BCE, get something like this. However, the, in case of an NMOS, these regions, right, where, okay, let me just go, go with the nomenclature first, then I will talk about these regions. So in case of an uh, in case of a MOSFET, this is called a saturation region, and this is called a linear region or triode region. In case of a BJT, this is called a saturation region, and this is called an active region. Okay. So just like in case of a, when you are when you want to make an amplifier in case of a in case of an uh, uh, in case of a MOSFET you would like to be in saturation saturation good linear bad in case of a BJT saturation bad <laughs> active good but I don't know why people have named it like this but this is what it is uh, one important difference between BJT and uh, and your uh, MOSFET is this edge of the saturation linear region and cutoff uh, in linear region. In case of in case of a BJT, in case of a MOSFET, was dependent on you had to have VD had to be one one threshold voltage above uh, uh, VD VDS minus uh, VTH equal to VG, uh, VGS minus VTH had to be uh, lesser than VDS and so on, right? In case so essentially, what meant that. For each of these curves on the left hand side, you, you would have a different edge. So, so each of these curves were on a different, uh, had, had a different uh, cutoff, had a different threshold point. But good thing about uh, a BJT is this threshold point is same. So if you change BBE, this will be one, B2 and so on. This is B3. So this threshold point is same. So you don't have to bother about one good thing, right? Less thing to think about. And this threshold point is is dependent on the type of device, which means it basically depends on type of PN junction. And this you can assume to be 0.65 volt or 0.7 volt or whatever. The analogy between uh, between a BJT and your MOSFET doesn't really stop here. Just like in, in case of a MOSFET, you have channel and modulation, right? You have a channel and modulation, and you see that these curves are not straight per se after saturation. So they go like this. Similarly, in case of a BJT also, these are not straight lines. They go like this. And just like in case of a MOSFET, we added this extra term. In case of a BJT also, there is an extra correction factor. By the way, this, if VB is better than VT, you can neglect that minus one term, right? So essentially, if you deal with this e to the power e b e over v t, 
forget about that minus one term and you have this correction factor of one plus pce by va that is this va is equivalent to one over lambda right so that's the that's the way the nomenclature goes not yeah we have but its mechanism is different right so it's a complete i mean device wise from device physics wise it's a completely different structure no relationship with mosfet but ultimately uh, from a circuit perspective you are not particularly concerned about how the device works you are only concerned about how id vds characteristics looks like and they look similar in fact if you go back to cathode ray tubes they also look similar if you go to the i mean even Currently, the state of the art devices, which are thin pets, they also have similar IDVDS characteristics. So, as long as you know how to deal with IDVDS characteristics, you are good. And let the device designers deal with the physics of the devices. Right? Okay. And the reason it's like this is something that we derive from first principles from why the nonlinearity and what else, why two one, why why one requirements. Because of that reasons, we ended up with this type of characteristics. So, so these are fundamental. You will, if you want to make a, a amplifier, you will need a device with these type of characteristics. Yes. Ah, VA is another constant based on uh, the type of devices. This VA is called early voltage. Again, nothing early about it. It's basically name of the inventor. Okay. Okay, so till now, I mean, everything is same, but there is one important difference. Uh, everything is similar. There's one important difference from which BJT becomes slightly, I mean, it behaves slightly differently with respect to a MOSFET. In MOSFET, your input current is zero, right? In this case, IG is zero, correct? In case of a BJT, it's not. In case of a BJT, your IP, is proportional to IC. So it becomes IC over beta. So beta is more than one actually. BJT amplifies the input current. Okay. A good BJT for a good BJT, beta should be very high. So, so given that you have these two current, these two equations, what do you think to make an amplifier? What is the first thing that you need to do? You have a new device. You want to make an amplifier with that. What is the first thing that you need to do? Yeah, you need to bias it definitely, but you need to know more about it, right? In the sense that how its incremental picture looks like, right? So what is this Y1, Y2, all those parameters, right? So if, unless you have that, you will not know what is the gain that you get. So tomorrow, if I give you any new device, you'll have to again go through the same procedures, right? So what will be your, let's say Y21, let me sketch. So basically nothing new as far as the structures are concerned, just the terminology is changed. This becomes emitter, this becomes collector, this becomes base. Your current IC is still controlled by PBE. Just like in a MOSFET, it was being controlled by VGS. In this case, current is still controlled by VBE. Just that we need to know what are the uh, what are the expressions for these control sources. So, if I call this GM, which is Y21, how will you find out Y21? What will you do? You have to differentiate the collector current with respect to the input port, right? Input port in this case is VBE. So, del IC. So this is Y21, del IC, del VBE, which is equal to IS by ET to the power. So by the way, this is for a constant VCE, right? This is a partial when the others are constant. So if I neglect that channel and modulation equivalent, which we did in case of a MOSFET also, so this approximately becomes, not approximately, this becomes I C by V T, right? So you, you you have the expression for G M. Then what about Y one one? Your Y one one is not 
zero in this case, unfortunately. So what is Y11? Right, so Y11 is del IB by del BB. Reciprocal of that, whatever you said, because this is conductance. So this is nothing but because I have this relationship, IB is IC over beta, where beta is device constant. This becomes IC over beta, BT. okay? So there is, again, a popular terminology of expression Y11 is called R pi. or rather one over R pi. So have you done this uh, pi equivalent network? Right? So it's basically when the BJTs came into being, pi equivalent network used to be the way of uh, analyzing. So the input resistance was called R pi. But again, nomenclature, nothing fancy about this. The key thing to remember, is here gm times r pi is beta, which is constant, the device constant. Okay. What about y22? What will be the expression for y22? Del ic, del vce, which will be what? It will be IC by VA. So you will get a Y2. So then you do all your analysis, whatever you have been doing with, with MOSFETs, right? All similar. The only key, the key differences are, as far as the small signal model is this. Right. Other than that, everything is same. Right. So we'll do a couple of them, couple of the analysis uh, in the next class, and we'll wrap. Okay. Thank you.